Hello, everyone. This is Jonathan Little. I'm here today with the 163rd episode of Weekly Poker Hand. This is a fun one today. We have the Ace-4 suited, which is how most good stories start off. So we're playing about 40 big blinds deep. I make it 2.5 big blinds from the low jack seat. Button, cut off, hijack, low jack. And I think this is perfectly fine and good. So the big blind, a tight aggressive guy calls. And the flop is going to come 10 of clubs, 9 of diamonds, 6 of clubs. Our opponent checks, and we bet 2,300 into what must be about a 5,000 pot. And this is a board, 10, 9, 6, where typically as the preflop raiser from early-ish position, you need to be somewhat cautious just because it's so easy for the big blind to have all sorts of pairs, right? And if your opponent has all sorts of pairs or straights or two pairs, you really don't want to be betting. Even with a hand like pocket aces, you have to be a little bit cautious because if you bet with aces and get check raised, you're not happy. And then let's say that you do call the check raise and the turn is a club or a jack or an eight or seven or even a 10, nine or six. All these cards are very bad for you. And if you face aggression on those cards, you really just can't continue, right? And if you're folding pocket aces, then obviously that's a problem. So against good aggressive players who will check raise you on this flop a lot, I definitely advocate checking back a lot. And whenever you have a range disadvantage, meaning your opponent should have a decent amount of hands, but also whenever you have a nut hand disadvantage. So in this spot, we likely have a range advantage, a small one if, if we're not breaking even, meaning you know we're roughly 50-50 against our opponent, but our opponent has way more nut hands than we do. Nut hands being like two pair or better. Just because our opponent's going to be in here with stuff like 9-6 and 10-6 suited and 8-7 offsuit. Whereas I'm not, I have no 8-7 offsuits in my range. I have no 9-6 offsuits in my range and no 10-9 offsuits, right? So the best hands I can have are hands like, well, the sets, but then over pairs. Whereas the best hands my opponent can have are well, all of the nuts, all the effective nut hands. So in those spots, you have to be a little bit more cautious and you need to be more inclined to check back. So... Anyway, on the flop, my opponent checks. This is a hand that you can certainly consider betting. All of your draws you typically want to bet, just because if your opponent folds, that's great. And some of your draws can actually withstand a decent amount of pressure, like this ace-4 suited, right? The nut flush draw is a very, very strong hand. So in this spot, I want to be betting with some of my overpairs, and then I want to be betting with stuff like queen-jack, king-jack and king-queen maybe, uh, most of the flush draws, and then the nut hands, and maybe hands that are somewhat susceptible to being outdrawn, like ace-10, king-10, queen-10, jack-10, ace-9, king-9, stuff like that. I think that would all be, those would all be reasonable bluffing hands. So anyway, or I say bluffing hands, those would be reasonable betting hands. So opponent checks, I bet about half pot, and now the opponent raises kind of small to 6,500. So I bet 2,500, he makes it 6,500. All right, well, calling's certainly fine. We're in position, getting good odds. So with a draw in position, getting good odds, calling is always a good option. And that should usually be what you go to. However, again, if you think about our range, like I just meant, laid it out here, we're going to have a lot of marginal made hands and some marginal draws. And then we're going to have some nut hands. So if you have some nut hands, like pocket tens, for example, or pocket nines or pocket sixes, I definitely want to get more money in the pot immediately while we're likely ahead with those. So we need to be re-raising. So if we're going to be re-raising with those, we want to make sure you're re-raising with some number of bluffs if we're trying to play a somewhat balanced strategy. We actually discuss all this in Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. So if this is like a different language, definitely check out that book. You can get it at jonathanlillipoker.com slash mastering. Um, so anyway, in this spot, we need to be re-raising with some bluffs. So which bluffs are the best bluffs to re-raise with? Well, Queen Jack of Clubs, I think, is a very good one. Um, king jack of clubs, queen jack, king queen of clubs, all those are pretty great because notice those hands actually don't win at the showdown very often, whereas this ace high can occasionally win at showdown, mainly when we're against a worse draw, like, well, king queen, king jack, queen jack, jack eight, stuff like that. So those are certainly the best hands to re-raise. If we had jack eight suited, that's a good one. And notice that all these hands have straight draws on top of the flush draw. So those are really good hands to be aggressive with. And generally, you want to be most aggressive with your draws that have a lot of equity, but don't have much showdown value. So that's usually the marginal flush draws with straight draws. So you want to look at your range, and do we have very many of those to start with? Well, we have king-queen, king-jack, queen-jack, 
maybe Jack nine, but I think we just want to call with that one. And then Jack eight. So that's only like, that's only four combinations of hands right there. And four combinations of bluffs is not very many. So we want to find other bluffs we want to re-raise with. Uh, you just start have to, have to start looking at the next ones. I mean, King nine, we probably don't want to bluff. So we don't have King eight of clubs I'm referring to. Um, so now we just have to look at the aces, right? Those are the next worst flush draws we're going to have. I mean, we could have nine, eight, but again, with the med medium pairs, we're just going to want to be calling the check raise because that hand has a lot of value and beats all of our opponent's draws. Um, if you think about all the eights we have with a flush, I mean, eight, six, we can't have. So we're raising eight, five. I mean, no, we're not raising eight, five suited. So that's not in our range. So the next worst flush draws are the ace high flush draws. So I would just start from the bottom and work my way up. Um, in this scenario, if we have, let's say we want to re-raise with all of our sets and most of our straights, that's going to be, well, three combinations of each set. So that's nine plus four combinations of eight, seven suited. That's 13 hands, right? And in this spot, we can really load up on bluffs here because whenever we do have the nuts, we're just going to have a huge advantage. So we can have, gosh, 20 bluff hands if we feel like it, maybe maybe even a little bit more. And because of that, I only the, the, the obvious ones I just listed out, there's only four combinations of hands. So we can now do ace two, ace three, ace four, ace five, ace seven, ace eight, ace jack. Ace, king, and ace, ace, queen, and ace, king. I mean, there you go. That's about nine combinations of flushes, flush draws. So now we're starting to get closer to like a 50 50 um, reign, a balance between nut hands and draws. Notice all these draws are very good. They all have lots of equity. So that's pretty nice. And in reality, we may be even to add, maybe able to add hands like queen jack to it as well. But that's when you start having too many bluffs. So be careful with that. Also, queen jack does quite poorly if your opponent's over there with, you know, King Jack of Clubs or something like that. All right, so I'm going to re-raise this hand. And I know that just sound like, sounded like a pretty long analysis for just a somewhat standard play, but this is the kind of thing you want to be thinking about when you are playing poker. And you also want to think about this ahead of time so that when you find yourself in the spot, you almost immediately know, okay, this is a reasonable re-raise hand. All right, so given the stacks, how much are we going to re-raise? Well, this is a spot where I like shoving with all of these hands. That may sound a little bit risky, but the thing is, is that if I re-raise to, let's say, 16,000, notice I'll have about half my stack in, and then my opponent's going to feel somewhat priced in to call um, a, river, a, a turn bet. And if I am bluffing a decent amount, like I just told you I'm doing, I don't really want my opponent calling. I want my opponent folding. So I need to use a bigger bet. If I use a bigger bet, say I make it 20,000, now I have almost all my stack in the pot, and that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So here I think we just need to shove. I know shoving is large, and it certainly is unfortunate when you go broke in a tournament where you just jam 40 big blinds in, but this is a spot where we're always going to have a pretty good amount of equity, especially with our exact hand, and given the range we just laid out, we should be in great shape. Um, one thing worth mentioning, you want to think about what that what shoving does to your flop calling range. So I just l laid out how I'm probably shoving all the sets. Um, I'd probably be calling with hands like two pair, you know, 10-9 suited, or 10-9 offsuit if I got really frisky. And then I'd also call with maybe some of the straights, because those aren't really that susceptible to being outdrawn. I mean, they are, but they're they're very, very strong hand where I certainly don't want my opponent to fold. And um, I'm going to have the ace 10s and king 10s and queen 10s. And you just want to be careful that your calling range is not all hands that are going to have to fold to additional streets of aggression. So keep that in mind. And as you take hands out of your re-raising range, your nut range, you want to make sure that you take out some of the bluffs because then you'll just have too many bluffs. All right, so anyway, I do jam. Let's see what the opponent does. Opponent does call. He has, ooh, king, queen of clubs. We got him. And he doesn't win, so that's very nice. Um, did the opponent do anything wrong in this scenario? I don't really think so. I think he could certainly check call the flop with this and then check raise the turn. If he did that, that would have been way nastier for me. Um, especially when the, the seven of spades happened to come on the turn. That would be a particularly bad card for me. I guess I would check back the turn a lot in that spot. So um, I, I don't really think the opponent did anything wrong. Should he have called our shove? That's the tough spot because when he has king, queen of clubs, notice he blocks ace, king, and ace, queen of clubs. So he's not worried about those. He also blocks king jack and queen jack of clubs, though. So those are hands that he would really like me to be in with, with you know, queen jack offsuit or king jack offsuit. 
And when he has the king and the queen in his hand, I can't have those. So now what do my bluffs look like? Well, they're going to be the ace-high flush draws. Maybe jack-8, which, you know, that that's still in great shape against him. Um, and what else? I mean, I guess I could have queen of spades, jack of clubs or something like that, but I, I may not, I'm probably not going off with those in reality. Cause like I said, that would be too many bluffs. So this is actually a particularly bad hand to call my shove with, even though he has a lot of equity, clearly the opponent has lots of equity he has over cards and a flush draw and a gut shot in terms of draws to call off with. This is one of the worst draws to call off with. He'd much rather have ace king of clubs, for example, or ace. He'd much rather have actually ace two of clubs because with ace two of clubs, then I could have king queen and king jack and queen jack, and I could even have the like queen queen of clubs, jack of spades, and stuff like that. So, um, this is a spot where I, it, it's an unfortunate spot for the opponent. The problem is that he's probably getting about the right price to call if he thinks his flush draw is good on the flop, even if he thinks I have lots of sets and two pairs. But whenever you start adding in the ace high flush draw to my range, my opponent's just screwed then. So, this worked out well for me. I'm not going to say he necessarily played it poorly, but. When you check raise with a very strong draw like this, you're certainly not trying to fold it. And that's just sort of the unfortunate thing in this scenario. If you don't think you're getting jammed on very often, like say my opponent thinks he's getting jammed on like 10% of the time or something like that. When that happens, you just have to make an unfortunate call off. But the other 90% of the time, it's going to work out well enough. So I like the way he played it. And um, you don't always win when you play it reasonably well. <laughs> All right, so that's going to be it for this episode of Weekly Poker Hand. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes. That would be very beneficial for me. Also, you know, share it with your friends. Tell your friends about this podcast. Uh, I want to do everything I can to help poker players who aren't afraid to get in there and study and work hard and really try to improve themselves. And I'm sure you all have a friend or two like that. And um, it'd be beneficial for them and for me if you would share that with them. So please do that. Thank you very much for being here today. I'll be back next week with another episode.